Okay, so today we're going to start right on time. We've got a schedule because we're sharing the space with a uh, robotics club. So they're in crunch mode. They've got their competition next week. So we'll, we'll just kind of work with that. Uh, might get a little noisy later, later but we'll, we'll segue from slides into more hands-on, so maybe that won't be a problem. Um, before we start, I want to do a couple of items of business just for those who are new, first time to the space. Uh, today's meeting is actually uh, a dual group. We're, we're both, um, Black Lodge Research has uh, a membership, and so uh, some of the Black Lodge members are here today to participate. Also, it's um, a group called Kingmakers. So we got both BLR and Kingmakers. So I'm a member of BLR, and as such, BL BLR group has allowed us to hold the Kingmakers meetings here. And then as you know, today is Arduino Day. I, I tried to look it up, why is today special? What's, what makes today Arduino Day? I couldn't find an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody the know? Day the day, no. right? I mean, oh. right. probably to uh, jump on that bandwagon. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, Arduino Day, so let's have a little class on Arduino. How to, how to use them, how they work. Um, because BLR Black Lodge Research is hosting, um, we asked that you drop a few bucks into the donation box. Uh, that helps us keep the rent paid and the lights on and such. Um, let's see, what other items of business? Uh, was, there, was there an announcement for, do you remember Taylor, what was Lee saying? For future events. Um, so we always put events out on Meetup. We also have it out on um, on our mailing list. Um, that's DC, the DC206.org mailing list. Um, we regularly hold other events uh, that we have on that board. Um, if anyone is interested in in a hangout on open pack night that happens every Thursday night, uh, starting at 7 p.m. Um, I'm not sure which item specifically we're thinking about that we were saying. That's, that's essentially, yeah, thank you. That yeah. covers it. Um, open hack night, if you want to come in and work on projects even though you're not a member of BLR, Thursday evenings at 7, um, we've usually got the door open. So. And that's anything? Anything you want to bring in Come in and work on it as a group or, or use the tools. Uh, all, all sorts of things happen here on Open Hack Night. Oh, wow, cool. Thursday nights, et cetera. Um, see, any other items of business? Volunteers to lead a class. Oh, right. Um, so, uh, Kingmakers, we're looking for volunteers for the next upcoming month or two or three. Um, anybody who has an expertise or uh, something they want to demonstrate or show others how to do in the maker spirit. Um, you don't have to be elaborate and do slides like I've done. Um, it can be something quite simple, just something you love, enjoy sharing, and we would love to have you share that with our king makers. So please contact either GT or myself and Let's do something along those lines. Okay, and without further ado, oh, yeah, one other thing is usually we have at the start of our Kingmakers meetings, we'll have what we call show and tell. Um, lamentably, due to the tight schedule today, we're gonna have to skip that, or maybe we'll be able to have a chance to hold some at the end. Um, but, but show and tell is really fun because makers come and they show us their projects, tell how they did it, why they did it, things they ran into, and show us how we can do it ourselves. It's, it's really fun. It's one of the best parts, my favorite parts. Um, so lamentably not today, but uh, next time coming to a Kingmakers near you. Okay, let's dive into Arduino. Except my display disappeared. Go. There it is. Okay. So, um, 
as was pointed out, a little sketchy. In the Arduino world, they call programs sketches. So uh, here's an Arduino. You've probably seen them before. But let's point out some highlights. It's all based on this chip right here. They call them microcontrollers. Microcontroller is essentially a, just a CPU where they've integrated some memory and some other capabilities. And it's all in that one tiny thank you, one tiny chip. Um, company that does this is called Atmel. They have a whole family of chips that are similar to this. And that comes into Arduino later on. We'll talk about flavors of Arduino. Um, Here's how it talks to your computer. It, this guy, he doesn't really have USB capability. So what they've done is used another chip, and that converts what they call serial to USB. Now we can hook it up. Um, the old ones used a power selection jumper. The, the current ones, they all automatically select. They got diodes in there so that you just plug in here or you plug in there and the power just works. It's nice. Voltage regulator, so you, you can power it with, um, I think, pretty much 6 to 12 volts. And this regulator brings it down to the 5 volts that the Arduino uses. So very, very convenient. In fact, in your kit, there's a 9-volt battery and a connector that fits this. Um, then, then there's the, the main interface, digital pins. These can be inputs or outputs, and we'll talk about that more. Power pins, um, V in here, that one actually connects to the power jack. So if you plugged in 12 volts, you'll see 5 volts, or 12 volts here. Um, on the other hand, if, well, never mind. Ground, 5 volts, and also 3.3 volts, and a reset pin. Um, any other things? Oh yeah, LEDs. These LEDs are extremely handy. Um, transmit receive lights, those will go blinky blinky when you're programming your Arduino. Let you know that it's happening. Sometimes it's just, it doesn't work for some reason or other. We'll go over some of those reasons. That's a nice verification. And the first program that we'll run today is the hello world of Arduino, where you simply blink an LED. So that one right there, the built-in LED, we're going to make it flash. Okay. Any questions so far? Does the battery run up for quite a while? Or do you need a um, that's a great question. Nine volt batteries tend not to last very long. Um, depending on how much you're doing with it is the other question. If, if the Arduino didn't light any LEDs and didn't um, run motors or anything, um, it, I, I don't know off the top of my head. You might last a day or two, but it's still not very long. Okay. So really, it's more just for the experimenting or developing. Gotcha. Um, if you go to something more serious, then you're going to need a bigger battery. OK, there's a fun bit of history. Um, why is it called Arduino? So clear back 2005, a little design institute, an art institute in Italy. One of the students um, decided to do a, a hardware design for his, you know, his graduating senior year thesis, essentially. And his idea was, hey, these microcontrollers are great, but they're hard to use. Um, in fact, I've got a story about that later. They can be very hard to use. And he came up with an idea. He says, I want to make this easy enough to use that even somebody completely tech unaware you know, the, the artists in the school, his, his friends, uh, the other schoolmates. He wanted anybody to be able to use it. So that's when the idea was born. And he, he created it. And, and, and here's even a picture of it. Lovely that they captured that. Um, this microcontroller again that you saw before. The regulator, power regulator. Uh, this right here is the crystal, the heartbeat, if you will, makes the thing run, and a serial port. Bada bing, bada boom. Well, the Ivrea Institute um, shut down just a few years later. The lack of funds, they, they couldn't pull it off. Um, 
Massimo Banzi was, I think he was the professor who um, coordinated with the student. He mentored the student on this. He decided to keep the project going. He liked the idea. He kept it going and he found a friend who was also interested in working on it. Well, they would get together regularly to work on this or did they go now that the school's closed down, they decided to meet um, once a week at the King Arduin pub. <laughs> it turns out King Arduin was an ancient Italian king 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. They named the pub after him. These guys developed it there. There you go. It's the Arduino. So that's a fun bit of background. Okay. Arduino, it turns out, is a small word that hides a great big ecosystem. There's a lot here. It's become outrageously popular, and for good reasons. And so now there's a lot to it. So now when we say the word Arduino, you may have to disambiguate in your head what we're talking about. IDE, essentially the software that you install and use to program it. The boards themselves. There's a thing called wiring. Um, there's been some confusion about what wiring is. It's not actually something that special in terms of a new language. It's actually more of a wrapper around regular C++ language. And, what the, and again, the idea here was to make it easy. They wanted to allow different flavors of Arduino, yet they wanted you to still be able to talk about these digital pins in a simple way. Because in microcontroller world, it's not simple. It's, and, and it's all over the map about how to talk to these pins. So they wanted to wrap that up in a nice package, put a bow on it, and make it easy. So now it's easy because you can say uh, digital pin two or seven and, and wiring takes care of mapping whatever this chip needs to talk about to that pin. So that's what wiring is. It's an extra layer that makes it easier to use the hardware connections. Processing was also part of the package. Um, think of processing as an animation tool. Again, it was targeted for artists, and so the idea is that they would often have things they want to animate whether it's a kinetic sculpture or lighting or whatever. And so the purpose of processing was to help with that. Okay, and then the heavy lifting. So even before Arduino started, there was already a community that was interested in these AVR they're called. That's the microcontroller that runs this. They were interested in the AVR family. So it's not just that chip, but there's a hundred different chips that are similar. And they took a version of new C compiler and targeted it for the AVR family. So they call it the AVR-GCC. So this compiler was already in place, good morning Alex, What's up, Dan? and ready to go. And so they were able to grab that build on top of it. So if somebody, <coughs> so if somebody, um, talks about, you know, oh, Arduino's not C, it's wiring. Well, yes, they're right, but really it's wiring on top of a regular C compiler. The good news there is for those of you that know C or C++, you can use all the language knowledge that you already have. All of that works on the Arduino. If you want to do object-oriented, it's there. It's available because it's the AVR GCC compiler. So good news there. Okay, and then another big factor that made Arduino explode is the shields. I have not yet figured out why in the world they call them shields. <laughs> but maybe there's a translation. Anybody speak Italian, technical Italian? I, uh, I don't know. Um, but one thing they did do is they said, okay, whenever we build an Arduino board, we're gonna lay out the pins, the connectors. They call these headers. So the headers will always be in exactly the same place. So that way, if you build a board that has pins 
on the underside that match, that mate with that, then it's guaranteed to work. So that's essentially an interface definition that they created. They said, this hardware plugs in, and if the voltage signals are the right ones in the right places, it works. So they created that standard, if you will, and sure enough, um, there are now thousands of shields out there. Uh, let's see, what examples do I have? Oh, one is uh, a little LCD display and keypad, and that's actually in your kit. Oh no, this one's just, just display. It doesn't have the keypad. Um, however, I do happen to have one of those. Looks like this. So, so there's, there's the Arduino, and here you can see the pin layout, and it just matches up. They did something which, frankly, I don't like, but it, again, it's great for newbies, those who haven't used it before. The spacing between these pins and these pins is different. So if you accidentally get it backwards, it won't plug in. So don't force it. Um, once it mates, though, you're good to go. OK. The other thing that doesn't really show here is, yeah, you create this hardware shield. That's great. You can just plug it in. But there's still actually a lot of work to use that hardware shield. So, so a lot of these, most of them, the people who create these, they're also going to the trouble to go out and create a library to go with it. So uh, Alex and I are working on a project right now. We're going we're gonna to light up some Nixie tubes. And we're also doing the library for it. We want to, again, it's this idea of make it super easy to use. What's a Nixie tube? Thanks for asking. Um, before LEDs, there were vacuum fluorescent displays. Before those, there were Nixie tubes. Um, think a vacuum tube. Um, but, and, and you know that you can get a glow out of the vacuum tube. Mm -hmm. Well, if you purposely put a little digit in there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, oh. it'll light it up a nice orange glow. They look great. Um, so yes, we're going to have a module that interfaces nicely with Arduinos. Okay. So here's another aspect of why I am a Arduino fan. These microchips, like I was saying, it's they're not as easy to use as you might hope. Um, when Arduino was first becoming popular, I found that there were other electrical engineers who were not fans. They would look at Arduino and they go, up, oh, it's a toy, up, oh, you can't do anything serious with it. Well, I was arguing with a friend one day. I'm like, well, have you ever had trouble installing tools and it took you three hours? I go, yeah, oh yeah, of course. I said, have you ever had trouble and it took you three days? And he says, yeah, once or twice that happens. I said, yeah, once I, it took me two weeks to get all the tools up and running properly. That's, that's a, a problem that the, you know, the microcontroller industry has not addressed properly. It's too difficult to use. And that's why you need uber experts to be able to use them. And why Arduino is so special, because guess what? It's five minutes. You download that IDE, install it, and it just works. That's the magic of Arduino. So that's why I'm a fan. OK, IDE, Integrated Development Environment. Fancy word to say that they took several tools and stuck them together. So the white space here is your editor, just a regular text editor. Um, this button is going to launch the compiler. And this button 
It isn't really a debugger, but it's our debugging method for Arduino. And I'll show you more about that. Okay, so the, the Arduino allows you to, Arduino ecosystem allows you to have multiple Arduinos. And actually I use that more than you might think. Um, sometimes you've got different flavors doing different jobs and you need to work with them both at once. So you'll need this COM port indicator. Well, I should amend that. If, if you're on a Microsoft box, then you'll need COM port indicator. A similar idea though for the Mac OS and Linux devices where you'll have what looks more like a path, but it indicates a unique device. So it doesn't auto select that for you. So whenever you hook up a new one, you have to go to the tools and the port and select the right port. Um, so that's the tools and board. Oh, right, so now there's lots of flavors. It used to just be there was one. Now you have to say, oh, I'm on an Uno, or I'm on a Mega, or I'm on a Teensy, or whatever other flavor there is. And, and those are the top five. If you know those five, you're off and running. Here's another thing that has really helped Arduino take off. Example files. When you first install the uh, IDE, it actually installs with it a, a good dozen or more example files covering um, a number of uh, things like uh, using the serial port or talking to an ethernet shield. Uh, what else? Um, talking to the spy bus, talking I squared C. Um, simple buttons and lights, things like that. And you'll see where you can simply go to the file and go to the examples section and boom, it pulls up one of these examples for you. Another thing that's really useful, when you get a shield and install the library that comes with it, a lot of times those libraries will include examples to show you how to use the shield. It makes it easy as pie. Okay, so here's one thing uh, to look out for if you're on Microsoft or Linux platform is whenever you open one of these files, it pops up a second window. So mind you, that comes from the Mac world. That's kind of how they do their desktop user interface. And that's where it was developed. So when they ported to Linux and, and Windows, then um, they kind of duplicated that by simply popping up a second window. So a lot of times you open Arduino, but then you go to the example you want, and so you just close the default sketch and go to your example. Okay, um, something to look for when you're having trouble talking to your Arduino. Um, this list, um, I developed this back in 2015, and the good news is they've come a long way since then. Um, this one has almost gone away. Um, this one has gone away. This one has gone away. That one's not related, that can still happen. Um, this one has essentially gone away. These, these don't happen anymore. Um, but as you try to talk to yours, you will run into both A and B still. That's just something you have to get used to doing whenever you first plug in, uh, especially a new Arduino. If, you've, if you just always use the same one though, and always plug it into the same port, it, it, it remembers that. So at least you don't have to select it every time. But just if you go to a new one, then, then you have to pick those. Um, I'm just gonna show this briefly. This one doesn't, um, well actually it will apply today. 
because we're, we're going to be using the code that they provide. So you're simply going to go to the sketch menu <coughs> item, and they've got an include library feature. And then you can add the .zip library. So we'll be using that. OK, I think that's what I have for slides. So next, let's go into uh, setting up your IDE. So who has it set up and ready to go? Who needs to do it still? You ready? You ready? ready? You ready? Not ready? OK. Um, Oh, okay. So for those, I, I forgot to mention it first. Yes. Um, here we go. Here's uh, the SSID is the Black Lodge, and the key the with a capital T. Black, capital B. That'll be quicker. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Any, anybody else need help getting the IDE going? Just for the installation part. Right. Yeah. Oh. That probably won't matter. So a good question, do we need the latest release? As, as long as it's relatively recent, uh, don't worry about that. You're probably fine. Um, I do want you to go ahead and copy the stuff off of your disk onto your desktop. Just create a folder called Elegoo or something and, and throw stuff in there. It turns out that disk access is super slow. So if you can go ahead and just pull it off of there and copy it, that'll speed things up. Did anybody have trouble connecting to their Arduino, or have you tried that yet? OK. Uh, that, that was another thing that used to happen a lot. In, in 2013, 14, 15, you'd try to connect your Arduino, and you'd run into driver problems. And uh, hooray, those seem to be a thing of the past. They, uh, they tend to just work these days. Um, Okay, got your copy? Okay. Anybody else need a copy of either the IDE or the material off the Elegoo disk? I need the material off the Elegoo disk. All right, so while that's installing, I'm going to talk about the basics of a sketch or Arduino program. Every program has to have a function called setup and loop. Actually, there's no caps, which, which matters, by the way. The language is case sensitive. Putting the word void here, a lot of sketches that you see won't include the word void. Void simply means we're not going to pass parameters into the function. And these are always done that way. They don't take parameters. So they're always void. And setup is where you're going to get things off and running. For example, if you've selected one of those digital I.O. points as Say you want 3 to be an input and 8 to be an output, you're going to do that here in setup. So inputs, outputs. Um, then there's another one that's very important because this is 
the way we debug on the Arduino, you say serial begin and then the baud rate, and I use I usually use this one. So pretty much all of my sketches will have serial.begin in it, so that can debug. So the point of setup is that it runs once. So when you hit the reset button, everything that's happening on the board halts. The chip itself goes through a very specific set of steps as a result of reset, and then it starts to run code again, and the Arduino framework does a little bit, including the piece that allows you to download a new sketch, and then it starts by calling setup. After setup is done, it's going to forever after call the loop function. And that's it. It just sits there and loops forever. Um, different from programming on a, on a desktop, right? On a desktop, you've got begin and end. And when your program ends, you go back to your desktop, your OS. There is no OS here. There is no desktop. What else are you going to do? You just loop forever. So until the power gets cut, it's going to run this loop. So that's the basic framework for an Arduino sketch. Since the serial dot begin and gets you the debugging information, is it sent to that serial window? Yes. So um, let's see. This is called the serial monitor. And when you call, yeah, it pops up a separate window. And you can s send text to that window. So there's, um, there's a related function <coughs> called serial.printline. And then you can put variables in there and look at what's in them. It'll send them through this serial port, and it actually it actually goes through the FTDI chip or the equivalent through the USB port. Arduino software on the other end catches it and displays it to that window. So that's how we get information out of that closed little chip into something that we can see. All right, so we're ready for hello world. Time to make the blinky light blink. Yes. So in order to get your blinky light to work, first we're going to make sure that you can talk to your Arduino. So. Go ahead and plug, grab your, grab your blue cord that's in the kit, plug it into your Arduino, and plug it into a USB port. And what we're going to do is check and see if your OS and your Arduino install can recognize the Arduino on the other end of it. Hopefully, it just is auto magic. These days it tends to be, but if you have any troubles, I've seen them all, so <laughs> we'll fix it. Yes? Uh, you have an example of the library in the path. Uh, is that, I downloaded the library from this site. Uh, is that the name of the library we should be importing? I think I have multiple zips for each of the different shields. Okay, <coughs> let's, let's look at that, see if I can follow what you're saying. Guess what? I for, I don't have the. If you go into English, go oh, here. oh, there they are. Okay, good. Libraries. Uh, oh, you went to libraries. Okay. I think you were showing uh, where you can pull libraries in, but you didn't give an example of what. 
about that? I thought there was one master zip, but it looks like you just one by one go through each one. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, this, uh, actually, actually, this is kind of the old way to do it, the dot zip, where you manually say, take that zip and add it to my Arduino ecosystem. Um, there's a new method for doing it where you set up a path that points to actually a, a big repository of libraries that, uh, that gets maintained by both Arduino and the community. And, and, the, and then you can go to that, that uh, tool, essentially, and search. And you can search, say, on the name of the shield, and it'll return results of libraries that are potentially the ones for your shield. Very, very convenient. You can see this in, if you go to the tools menu, there's, there's a manage library. This is, and that's the, the tool he's saying. If you bring that up, it allows you, it will show you the available libraries on the web. So, it's also on the top of the yeah. library where you put Awesome. So here, if I go to sketch, you'll see there's the include library that we talked about before. There's some that you get by default. There's a bunch that are included. But then there's also some here that are there because I've added them since. But then as Michael was mentioning, there's the manage libraries. So be aware of this because this can be a, a more convenient Way. For example, if I wanted to find a library produced by the uh, great hacker known as um, Makuna, there you go, it shows up right there. So the managed libraries is just going out to the web? Yes. And it's a collection of libraries located somewhere on the web? That's correct. And then you have to actually bring them into your ID environment? When I, when I click on this, I get an option. Well, I've already got this one installed, but, and so I can update. Um, but if it was one that I didn't have yet, then, then you get an install button. Oh, so. Okay. Well, Okay, and so then when you get the install button, does that actually install it this in the more traditional library space? Yes. Folder? And then it shows up just like all the other examples. Okay. Yep, very handy. Okay, so for this one, you can see I had a sketch up from earlier. I was working on something. Um, we're going to go to File. We're going to go to Examples. We're going to go to Basics. And here's one called Blink. So I want you to all see if you can find that. And you'll note that when I click that, here I've got an, another window that pops up as opposed to changing the window that I had, just the way they do it. Got some mention of what's going on and who did it. And then this is the whole thing. Here's the whole sketch, the whole program. And you'll notice that there's a setup and a function called pin mode. And they're setting it to an output. So this is common that you need to set up outputs. They all default to inputs which is essentially a safety feature, right? Instead of resetting and then jumping right into driving lines high or low, they say, oh no, we're gonna wait till you tell us to output something. For now, we'll just listen to the lines. So they default to inputs. You want it to be an output, you have to tell it to be an output. In this case, they've got what's called a macro, a predefined value for LED underscore built in. That's handy because um, it used to be that the LED was always on pin 13 of an Arduino, digital 13. 
Uh, however, some of the really tiny ones don't have enough digital pins to have 13 of them. They, they might only have four IO pins. So they, instead of having a fixed number, they just have this defined and it's usually available. Most Arduinos have LED built in and that'll point to your LED. Then we go to the loop and what are we doing in the loop? Yeah, set the output high, delay 1,000. These are in milliseconds, so 1,000 is one second. And then go low. So what's it going to do? Pretty simple, right? And do it forever. Blink, blink, blink. Great question. Question was, I plugged my board in, and it started blinking already. What's going on? It turns out that it's common to ship Arduinos with the blink example already programmed. This is very common. So yes, if it's already blinking, that's okay. What I want you to see though, is that when you say program, do you remember where the program button is? It's, uh, it's this right hand arrow right here. Now let me talk about these two buttons. There's actually two buttons there. One is compile, the other, they call it verify. Um, the verify button is gonna run a compile sequence, but I haven't really found value in it. I have found that 99.99% .99 of the time, if it verifies okay, I want it to go ahead and upload. So that's the only difference between these two buttons. This one compiles and uploads, automatically assuming the compile completed successfully. This one compiles and then stops. It's like, well, what's the use of that? I don't know why that button's there. But if you don't happen to have your Arduino with you and you're just coding and you want to know what you fake and compile, that's the go. only there you reason go. I use that. So if you don't I want the upload, use this one. Um, usually just hit the right hand arrow, it will compile and upload. So while it's uploading, watch closely because you'll get the other two lights are going to flash. It, it, it flashes quick first where it's essentially saying, yes, I have a bootloader and I can talk to you about a new program. And then it says, okay, here it comes and it sends the new program down. Oh. Um, Should we select a serial port for that? Yes, before you can get that to work, you'll need the serial port. Uh, the example for Blink has changed since you've done this. Oh, okay. Um, they, they aren't using the LED built in. No. So there's, there's a couple people noticing, I just noticed this also. Um, they've changed it now that they actually have a global LED value and they have a big comment field above it. Pin 13 is for this board. This is for this board. This oh, okay. Is. So for some reason they're not using the LED built in. Not sure why they wouldn't. So have. some people may be confused by that. What, what version of the IDU are you using? 188. Okay. I've 189 and it's showing up. Yeah. yeah, I'm on this ancient one point, or yeah, 8.5. <laughs> okay, so you have a blinky light? Yep. Blinky light? Mm -hmm. Blinky lights? Blinky error. light? Okay. Okay, problem uploading to board. So the first two things to check are tools and board. You've got the Uno. Okay, that's good. Okay. The other is port. Okay, pick the Arduino one. The Arduino one, this one here. Yeah, there you go. Try it again. Yep. Now I'm just changing the delay values and just monkeying around. That's Fantastic. Right. Okay. Good to go. Yeah, so that's the, that's the next assignment. I want you to change the delay values to something interesting and verify that it really is your Blink program.
Nice vest. Fantastic. Note that you can change to something asymmetric, too. You could do 300 and 600, and then it'll be on more than it's off. Also, I have another line. I have another No, you could just change these numbers here. I don't know the Oh, oh, oh. It's the street single value, right? Uh, the thousand, you mean? Oh, there's two delays. Yes, so they're, they put it in so there's one delay between after the high and then a separate delay after the low. Okay, I think everybody's caught up to there. Okay, so we're ready to talk about, um, I want to point out this, uh, where is it? Yeah, here we go. In your Elegoo materials, there's a data sheet folder. And I can't tell you how delighted I am to see this. Um, there have been enough times where I've tried to use a part or a shield and could not find information on it. Sometimes you just need to know which digital pin does something. And if you can't find it, how are you going to use the part? Well, this is the right way to do it. Grab those data sheets and include it with the materials. So all the stuff in your kit has a data sheet associated with it. Even the humble capacitor here. <laughs> Show you how far apart the pins are and what the max voltage it can take is and all of that. see what else we got here we go here's a stepper motor included in your kit you want to know how to use it well it turns out the answers are in here the uh, zoom in so you can see this one of the most important things is well which wire is which you know I've got five wires coming out of here what do they do well, here you go. Here's the answer. They've got it carefully labeled. The yellow is this lead of that part of the coil. Red's the common one. They've included these data sheets. I love it. Nice job, Elegoo. So I want you to know that that resource is there. And I haven't checked exhaustively, but it kind of looks like they've included everything. Uh, here's another fun one. You want one of the knobs that you can dial to set the launch speed of your rocket? Here you go. Got your rotary encoder. Uh, set the new vector for your boat, whatever. Tells you how it works. And you want to write software for interpreting it? Um, there's a library out there. You can just use a library, or if you're interested in doing your own, they tell you exactly how it works. A to C switch goes high, later the B to C switch goes high, et cetera, et cetera. That's how it works. Okay, that's enough on the data sheets. Let's talk about breadboards. I suspect a lot of you have seen and or played with breadboards before, but just to be sure, let's see, what was that? Maybe that's not in data sheets. There was a breadboard in the data sheet. There was? Oh, there's the breadboard power supply module, but I think there's another one that's Sorry, I just can't see it. Um, go down to where it says 8.30, a little further down. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You know, you kind of lose your mind when you're up at the front of the class, yeah. All right. Here's really all you need to know about these breadboards. By the way, another fun historical note. Breadboard, why do they call it a breadboard? Well, guess what? Way back before Radio Shack existed, how did people build 
electric circuits. <laughs> Clearly with bread. Well, they needed an insulative material that was easy to use, right? Somebody came up with the idea that the same board that you use, you know, when you're cutting your bread, take that and pound some nails into it. Take the wires, because remember, the wires started off, the wires didn't even have insulation on them. They were, it was air insulation. So they'd take the wire and they'd wind it around one nail and run it over here and wind it around another nail and, you know, connect the capacitors and resistors in between these nails that were pounded into a breadboard. So there you go, historical reference, what a breadboard is, why it's called that. How they work is simply to provide a whole bunch of internal connections. So I'm going to need to say even a simple circuit can quickly use like 20 connections. Well, if you had to painstakingly twist wires together or try to use alligator clips and, and wires and clip them together, it would soon get laborious. This is an invention to make it much easier to help uh, hook up circuits. So what's very common is to run power strip. So the intention here is that you can connect this to ground and then any part that needs to connect to ground can plug into one of these holes. Maybe you make this one plus five, maybe you make this one plus three or some other common connection. Um, and then each of these rows of five are connected together. Notice that they don't connect across the center. Um, that's on purpose because a lot of times you have chips. I mean, the Arduino microcontroller chip itself actually can plug directly into one of these breadboards because the pins line up with those holes. So you could, if you wanted, take that thing out of there, plug it into your breadboard. So that is how we make connections. Is that clear to everybody, how a, a breadboard works? If you, I've opened one of these up before, and behind it, they've got a little metal, looks like a tray, essentially, with fingers that stick up, five pairs of fingers, and the fingers are like this. And so you're inserting a wire down in between the two fingers. It opens up a bit and pressures to make a little contact. There's limitations to this, um, but for prototyping a smaller or simpler circuit works pretty well. So that's what we're going to be depending on today. All right, it is time to go to your materials and we're going to look at the actual lessons that they provide. So open this Elegoo Super Starter Kit for Uno PDF. Oh, it's here. Oh, yeah, right, you got it. It's this one, Elegoo Super Starter Kit. I think it's in the same folder that the code and the libraries are. Although I may have placed mine in a different configuration. And what we're gonna do is go down to lesson three. You can use control F and say lesson three if you want. And it just says LED. And for this one, we actually won't be using the Arduino. This one's more just a super basic circuit. This is, essentially, this is the most basic circuit you can have that you can see anything happening. <laughs> We're going to simply light an LED. So the Arduino does get used, but really it's just the power supply. It's providing some voltage that we'll use. Here we 
There's another review of the breadboard, shows how they're connected. <coughs> In uh, the maker world, we love LEDs. So I want to give you a mnemonic to help you remember. LEDs only work in one direction. They are polarity sensitive, polarized devices. So when you see it on the schematic, it is literally a diode. You can use it as a diode. They show that it's a light emitting diode with the extra little arrows like this. And the reason for the triangle is that current only flows one direction. So this side is called the plus, or more formally the anode. This side's called the minus, or cathode. Um, and because you've got to get this in the right way, I've got a little mnemonic for you. Plus length equals plus voltage. So if you want the current to flow, make sure that the longer lead on your diode goes to the more positive voltage. Plus length, plus voltage. Very handy for remembering how an LED goes. Then they talk in here a little bit about uh, what the resistor's for. So I've had students that forgot their resistor. Anybody knows what happens if you forget your resistor? It lights up once. It lights up once. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening is it's, it's conducting current, and there's nothing to stop it from conducting as much current as possible which it turns out is enough to superheat it and literally burn it out. So it, it starts off glowing its proper color, then it changes to the orange of uh, hot iron, and then briefly to white, and then nothing. <laughs> and yes, it's burned out. Um, yes. So what happens is there's a voltage drop. And for this LED, it's probably 2.2 volts. So whatever the voltage is here, say if it's 5, then there's going to be a 2.2 volt drop to, uh, what is that, 2.8 over here. That's when it's working normally. <clears throat> if you force it, then yes, you can get a bigger drop across there, but then it runs too much current. <clears throat> okay, so. I guess to follow up with that, you've got a bunch of these in series. Each LED is going to have its own internal resistance of some amount. If you had enough in series, would that not uh, prevent it from burning out? The answer is yes. And sometimes when you see LEDs that are that you can plug into the wall, it won't be a single LED. It'll be a whole string of them. Because they need to cover you know, only 2.2 volts at a time, but they got to span the whole 170 volts that come out of the socket. Um, Resistance is tricky to talk about with LEDs, and the reason is this. Normally, with resistance, you take um, current and voltage, and if you have a straight line, that's resistance. In fact, now that you mention it, I'm wearing an appropriate shirt. <laughs> this, is, this is normal ohmic resistance, and then it'll always be a straight line. You know narrow or steep, that's how much resistance. But with LEDs, what happens is it looks more like this. So there's kind of this sweet spot where it 
it conducts a reasonable amount of voltage of current and the voltage doesn't change too much. So when I say 2.2, it's really more like 2.1 to 2.3, depending on whether you're putting, you know, 10 milliamps through it or 50 milliamps. So that's what we're going to experiment with here is we're going to allow different amounts of current to go through this LED and see what happens. Okay. Um, we can spend some time on resistors, but I kind of hesitate to. I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's something you can learn on your own if you want. Maybe some of you already know how to read resistor values. There's a color code for it. Um, for now, let's just go with, with the ones they tell us. So there's more detail on the colors. And oh, I would would be yeah, wouldn't be surprised. I'll bet there is. Yes. Yeah. You can just type in the pan and Google and just try to see. Okay, you can Google it. Okay, so. Go ahead and find the parts in your kit. You'll need a couple of wires to bring in power from your Arduino. Here they've put them into the power rails. Then you notice they've got the short lead going to ground because it's negative length goes to the negative voltage. The positive length goes here through the resistor <coughs> to the positive voltage. So go ahead and hook that up and see if you can get your LED to light. Yes. You can buy resistors that already have, I mean, sorry, buy LEDs that are higher voltage or you just have resistors kind of in them or something already? Yes, you can. Um, they tend to not be uh, in this package like, like the ones we have here. Those will tend to be the ones that have the, the screw base and they're meant for 12 volts and they'll use them for industrial panels and, and things like that. It's rare to have the resistor built in for this type of package. You can go that, you can get them in a bag on eBay. And, um, and I have one put directly in my building. Okay. So the, the thing mm -hmm. about having the resistor included and the voltage specified is that they're selecting a brightness and a current for you. So it's fixed, you you can't change. Well, you could turn the brightness down by adding another resistor, but otherwise you're stuck with what they give you. Oh, you're saying I'm changing the R value and then you can't? Um, you can't subtract from the built-in R value, but you could add to it. Try it, see if this will snap oh. through it. If it's small enough. Yeah, it will. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Fingernail clippers will work. Will that work? This is a small enough one. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. By the way, I forgot to mention at the start that if you need to use the restroom, there's one out this door and a little off to the left there. Yeah, that's a good question. 
the point of the battery? I'm not sure. Maybe disconnect here. Yes. So you've got your blink running, and if you disconnected and powered here, it would start the blink again. Yeah. But otherwise, when you're you don't need the external power. Right. Take it home with you. Please put 35 in the donation box. Yeah. We just donate it on PayPal. Oh, I see. Okay. No, that works. That's equivalent. Yep. Okay, if I open this again. Oh, that's, that's fine. You keep it being noisy when you were trying to talk. Oh, I guess. you couldn't hear. I see somebody's got a whole array of LEDs going. Very nice. <laughs> oh, before you plug that in, you just reminded me of something. I just remembered something to warn you of. Um, one thing I don't like about, excuse me, this style of resistor is, what, what this is meant for is mass production. So they've gotten the really cheap rolls of mass production resistors and clipped them apart to put in our kits. Um, when these go into mass production, they've actually got a machine, pulls these things off of the reel, and it has two knives, and it goes snip, 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 snip and it, pull, it, it cuts off the taped part. Um, for us, uh, what usually happens is you grab these and just pull it out of the tape, but there's one hazard to that. It leaves adhesive on the end of your resistor, and sometimes that's enough to get between your resistor and the contact pins inside that breadboard. So I prefer to clip them. I didn't think to bring snips for everybody today. Um, but maybe if you just uh, rub at it a lot, yeah, yeah, if you would, there's an electronics bench just behind this wall. Let's see if there's some in there. It's not useful. Yay. Most likely not. They've actually got a little bit of protective circuitry on the board. What, without going into too much, I, I've been messing with another board and I was pulling connections on and off. Right? And somehow I shorted out the, I don't know if there's like a step, there's like a transistor, right, that goes from 12 to, to 9, then it's to 5, and it's, it was Uno board, right? right? And at a certain point, I was trying to put my three printer together, at a certain point, my Mac just went shut off and I went, oh, 
And so I yanked it out, and then I did some research, and I realized I had fried that little transistor, and it was shoving, like, instead of 5 volts up here, it was shoving, like, 9 volts up here. But the Mac, fortunately, just cut off. But that was my other cheap old Mac. This is not my cheap old Mac, so I got you. Okay, so um, just gunshot, that's all. Um, um, the, the newer ones, they're using some newer parts that are a little more robust. They've got more protection features. I think this one, even if you shorted it out, it, it detects that and quits sending current. It shuts off the okay. current. Okay. I, yeah. Because that, that's, that's, oh, really that's nice. true. I guess there's no power supply over here providing power back, so it doesn't matter. The worst thing you right. could do would be destroy this chip. Shorting it out, yes. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, oh yeah, good question. I, a question I had, are the resistors directional? The answer is no. Most resistors have no polarity to them. You can put them in this way, you can put them in that way, works the same. You're just trying to mess with people's minds. Tools. We'll keep it quietish. Um, no running up and down the stairs. Okay. So, cool. But just get want to them make back sure in the cell. Yeah, yeah, because they're kind of hanging out. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome turn. Smashing it. Yeah. And a barbecue and chicken and queso. Okay. <laughs> cool. Okay, let me talk about schematic symbols for a moment and two options of circuit here. Anybody want to take a guess as to which circuit you've just built? So we got the plus five, right? Comes across, connects to the resistor. So it's this one. What would happen if you did this one? I've got, got a few votes. The answer is these will work identically. Really? Yes. Okay, there's, there's, there's one subtle difference, and that is if you were to take your voltmeter and put it here between them, on this one it would be 2.8 volts, whereas on this one it would read 2.2 volts. Because with diodes, they have that forward voltage drop, it's called, of 2.2 volts. So it drops that, and the resistor automatically takes the rest of it. So here it's 2.2 and 2.8. Here it's 2.8 and 2.2. But otherwise, identical. They will both run the same amount of current and give you the same brightness. What's the drop for the diode then? Approximately 2.2 for these, yes. Um, notice, note that it'll be different for different color LEDs. Blue LEDs tend to be more like three volts. Green ones might only be two volts. And if you have a question, you can go to the data sheet. All right, all right. Okay, so now that you've done it with the 220, 
the red, red, brown. I want you to try it again with the uh, the 10K, brown, black, orange. So just, you can leave the rest of the circuit there, just pluck out the resistor and go to brown, black, orange, and let's see what happens. What do you see? Dimmer. Dimmer? Quite a bit dimmer. <laughs> so here's how to tell how much current's going through your LED, right? Your uh, your current is going to be, well, here you look at the triangle, right? So your current is going to be the voltage over the resistance. So V over R. So here we saw that it's 2.8 volts across the resistor, right? So 2.8. And we tried 220 before. So what's that going to be? It's going to be a little shy of 10 milliamps. Let's call it approximately 9 milliamps. So you, you saw how bright 9 milliamps was. Latest LEDs can get a lot of light out of just 9 tiny milliamps. It's pretty impressive. Now what happens if we change this to the 2.8 over the 10K. What is that? That's, uh, well, I need my calculator. <laughs> milli. Uh, oh no, that would be 0.28 milliamps. So this, this is an this is a really small amount of current. This is great. If you've got a battery-based project that you're doing and you want that battery to last forever and you're okay with this level of brightness, stick a great big 10K in there. It'll help your battery last forever. Only 0.28 milliamps. And as you can guess, when you stick in the 1K resistor, it'll be somewhere in between medium brightness. Okay. Let's move on. Let me have you scroll on down in your PDF to lesson four. We're going to expand from a single LED to now red, green, and blue. We're going to use this device. What they've done is the same, the exact same process in the semiconductor fab for red, green, and blue LEDs, but then they take one of each of those. So if you can imagine, the, the semiconductor wafers these days, they're 11 inches. They're gigantic disks. Well, I don't know what it is a tenth, a hundredth of a square millimeter or something for the LED itself. So how many millions they can fit on one of these wafers? Part of why LEDs are so cheap. But they got to pluck one of those out for red, another one out for green, another one out for blue, and put them together into this little package. They actually have little wires that jump from each of the LEDs to the, the big wires just so that we can use the things. And that's how you get 
RGB into one little device. So go ahead and continue with the instructions for hooking that up. Broke my pneumatic. Oh, how <laughs> how rude! Um, actually, you can get these in both styles. They have common cathode versions, and they also have common anode versions. It's just which end gets stuck together. So here, because it's common cathode, it'll look like this. <coughs> So if you look at the data sheet, it'll look something like this. Inside, the cathodes are all tied together and come out as one pin. To complete the circuit, we'll take this, connect it to ground, put the limiting resistors on top, and hook them all to plus five. They, yeah, for this one they did. So this gets back to my, my question. Could you just put the limiting resistor on the negative side and just use one? Here's the problem with that. Remember we mentioned how they, the different colors have different feed forward voltage drops. So if this one is a 2.2 and this one is say only 2.0 but the blue is say 3.0 for a for a standard forward voltage drop then these all get forced to the same voltage. It'll be some conglomeration in between two and three, I'm not sure where it would land. Depends on the, the individual curves, right? Because maybe red's here and maybe green's here, but maybe blue's up there. And when you force them to be together, what happens? Um, possibly <laughs> most of the current goes through the one with the least forward drop and a only a little goes through this one, and this one doesn't even light up. Something like that, probably. So yeah, in this case, we're going to have different voltages at each of those tie points. So if you did that, then what had happened is that most of the current would go through green. Electricity likes to take the path of least resistance. Path of least resistance. Would it be the green or would it be the blue? I might have that backwards. Because, because if blue has a three, then it's actually two volts across the resistor. Oh yeah, that works. Yeah, so three volts across the, the green resistor, which is the most current. So that's what would happen. You'd mostly get green and probably not get any blue. No, this has more to do with the physics of how the diode works and this, this funny curve. The, the resistor is easy because it's just a straight line. 
It's the diode that um, kind of decides what's going on. Um, when you're deciding how a, a circuit's going to work. Is it, is it the voltage and the current that's on the top right there? Or is it just the diode there? Great question. Is it the current or the voltage that decides how bright a diode gets? So it, just in general, devices will tend to work as voltage devices or as current devices. And, and with diodes, they're generally considered a voltage device. But, but even though this voltage here is essentially 2.2 volts, if I draw this more carefully, you'll see that there's still a slope to it. So down here on the bottom end, maybe it's 2.2. Up here on the top end, it might be more like 2.4. And down here, you're only doing 1 milliamp, whereas up here, you're doing 10 milliamp. So that's, that's where you're operating. And this is a saved zone. You, you're not putting too much current. So here what we're doing is counting on a fixed voltage, essentially. In reality, there's a range, but it's, you know, 0.2 volts, fairly well fixed for good enough for most circuit designs. And then you just decide how much current you want to flow through it by setting the resistor. This is great. We're getting into basic electronic design. Oh, that's because the first three don't have code to them. Oh, oh I see. Somewhere else. The wrong directory. Oh, are you looking for the PDF? Yeah. Okay. Um, Go into the. <laughs> oh, it's that one right there. Oh, it's this one? Yeah, that. I thought it was like how to get off. So this is from where I was trying to get in. Yes, so now if you zoom down to lesson four, that's where we're at. Yeah. you go back to that bench and see if you can find um, ideally needle nose pliers with smooth jaw um, teeth. You know what I mean? Oh, do you know what I can do? Do you know there might be some as well on this other bench? Second one, you're correct. They are not they're independent. Have to manually do it. Got it. Got it. Pop it on the PDF now. Okay. Off and running.
questions. So nice. That's right. Nice. So what does happen? Yeah. Do we have any sort of bring out? I, I just don't understand like what the program does. It's just that I'm uploading and it works. But if I want to learn what, like, what exactly what's going on here? Yeah. Okay. Let's let's talk about that. Okay. So I need to hit on PWM, a little cute little acronym, pulse width modulation. Pulse width modulation is a way to go from the digital world back to the analog world. Kind of funny because we spend a lot of time. Um, actually, I'm going to interrupt that because I want to have you all work on something while I talk about this. Our next, our next lab is going to be using the buttons, the push buttons. So find your little push buttons packet. And I've better for cutting. That one's for cutting, yeah. yeah. And this one. Um, so we found some pliers here, sort of. And I just want you to do something really quick with, with two of your buttons. They, they form the leads on these with a little squiggle in them. That's because they've got a machine that automatically picks these up, puts them into the, the circuit board as it's assembling the circuit board. And that shape helps it stay and not pop back out before it gets soldered. However, this doesn't work great for breadboards. Sometimes you try to insert these into a breadboard and the pin just bends and goes off to the side. So I found it really helps. You take pliers, needle those pliers, and bend these suckers straight. Except these are the medical, so they clip, but something like that. Just a quick smashing of that rounded plug back straight again will make a difference. So let me start this one on this end. And come to think of it, I think I've got some more needle nose out in the car. I'll be right back. There's one back there already, so pass it that way. <laughs> okay, so here's pulse width modulation. Pulse width modulation get, is, takes a digital output and makes it act a bit like an analog one. With an analog signal, we could have an output that you know, varies wherever we want it to, right? Kind of like if you've ever seen the, the digital or the squiggles that come out of a, an audio analysis bit of software. They show you the waveforms, audio waveforms, or maybe you've seen something on an oscilloscope. These are analog waveforms. Um, digital, we can't do that. We're either high or we're low. 
so the question is, how did they make these smooth color changes when all you've got are these highs and lows? Well, the answer is what you see here, pulse width modulation. So here's what's going on. If you take the light and you turn it on half the time and off half the time, think back to your blink program, right? It was on for a second and then off for a second. But if you do this really fast, which is easy with these microcontrollers, what will happen is that you end up with an effective average value. You're, <laughs> it's actually a hack because it's the human eye that does the averaging for you. Your, your, your rods are, can only respond so fast. And they're actually integrating over time the, amount, the number of photons that they get. So if you do this fast enough that the eye can't see it anymore, it looks like a medium brightness LED. So now if you take one LED and it's at medium brightness and another one is mostly bright, you get a mix of colors. And that's what that other uh, color diagram was. You saw where they intersect. You can get the cyan and the yellow and the purple, right? If you mix colors. Well, by running PWM, and, and you see that this is pretty fast, one five hundredth of a second, we're getting many pulses. So do it fast enough, and you get a pretty good way to control. So I can set it up here at 75%, down here at 25%. And PWM is a, a great little hack, and it gets used for a lot of things, actually. Um, motor speed control, also used uses PWM. Very handy tool. Um, handy enough that, that this is actually a built-in feature of the microcontroller. And Arduino just said, hey, that's a feature. Let's use it. A lot of microcontrollers have it. Very handy. So nothing super magic about it. It's just a digital waveform. Very fast. Gets averaged. Becomes an analog signal. OK. We're ready then for our next lesson. Let's move to lesson five. And we'll use those push buttons that you just straightened the leads on. It actually ends up taking less power, the controlling this is a relatively minor, I mean, microamps of essentially nothing to do this. And the moments where this is off, yeah, you're not sending current to the LED or the motor or whatever. So it does, it saves power. So the 50% would probably be the most efficient use of power then. If you um, want to make it seem like it's on. Uh, in, in, this, in certain cases, yes, but as a general statement, no. D it totally depends on the application. Yeah, that's the funny you thing. You yeah. uh, yeah. So there's another secondary thing, which is uh, an interesting artifact that persistence of vision in our eyes if you have an LED that's pulse width modulated dimmer, if you move it quickly across your vision or just shake your head like this, you can actually see it flicker in your vision now. So you can pick it up. Um, so there's a certain frequency that it has to be turning off and on before your eyes can't pick it up when you do this. And you can see this in car blinkers that are LED. Some of them actually are pulse width to be not as bright. And you can see that by if you're glancing around, you'll see some bright light be kind of flickering. <coughs> but if you look right at it, it looks solid. <laughs> I see that in movie theaters all the time. When they're coming out, those lights, they guide you out, and they move my head. Why yeah. like, what is that all about? The they're dim. Because they're dim. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, if, if you look at it, you don't see it. Not exactly. from, like, I know.
Okay, so the new component here are the push button switches. We're going to have an A switch and a B switch. And for this sketch, they're connected to D8 and D9. And our output is D5. Now they've shown a fancy form of the switch here, which points out that there's four pins. But in reality, there's really just two pin, two connections, two pins on each connection. So, so be sure which way you've got your switch and which one is the, the two different uh, connections, right? How, how can you tell by looking at the, the component itself? Can you tell there's two pins? There are sides with no pins on them and sides with pins on them. If you look at a side with pins on it, then there are two different connections. Does that make sense? Here's, here's a better way to show this switch. So internally is the red stuff. So these pins feed straight through, okay? This is always connected to this. There's, it's just metal. It's a convenient way to build the switch, makes them cheaper. Um, two, two straps of metal, you push the push button down and it puts a plate across the two metal tabs, completes the circuit, a switch. Here's the more common schematic form. It's literally just <laughs> a little bar that moves to the side. That's a switch. Then I 
enough to make that fly? Some fingers are stronger than other fingers when I push things into the breadboard. Is that um, a normal thing? Yeah, so I've, new. So I've got, okay, so I've got ground going to the strip right here, and ground goes to the long end of the LED. Then I've got a resistor going over this, and then I've got the LED going to pin minus 5. Okay, so did, did I hear you say the long end of the LED? Is going to ground. Is that wrong? Uh... Plus length, plus uh, voltage. Okay. Classic blender. All right, let's see. Ha -ha! There you go. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Not sure what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm just following matching colors. I Looks like you got it. Give it a try. Okay. Well, I thought I loaded it. Okay. Now try your buttons. No luck? No. I wonder maybe I put the buttons in sideways. Let's jump to the buttons. To these, this connect. Dope. No, you've got it right. Hmm. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to ground here, so I should be coming off of. Eight. Eight and nine, yep, that looks yeah. good. Maybe I pro uh, roasted something in that process. Let me check your LED. Can you tell by looking at it? When you're talking about power, you're talking about heating your heat. Yeah. I'm going to put it in backwards and now. Yeah, let's try it the other way. <laughs> this is how it burns when you get hot. So do that. So we, we still have it loaded. Yeah, now. still loaded. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay. Oh, okay. So. Good. Okay, so I want to talk about um, one particular aspect. Something new here with the with the Arduino input capabilities. You'll notice that in the setup code, there's a call to pin mode. And this time, instead of output or input, they've got something called input pull up. These have a feature where instead of having to add an external resistor, there's one actually built into the chip. So what's happened here is this is approximately a 20K resistor. and it's now connected to plus 5 volts. So anytime you go out and you say digital read, this is going to read high because it's connected to plus 5. Does that make sense? Now, if I close this, I've, I've shorted the bottom side of this to ground. A little bit of current will flow through here to ground, but when the microprocessor reads the input, it's going to see ground. It's going to see zero volts, and it's going to give you the low. That's how buttons work. That's how you keep it to just a resistor and a button. And in this case, we can use the built-in resistor. So that is the, the magic of input buttons. So pull-up doesn't add the resistor. The resistor is already there. 
it's using that as a type one. It's it's there, but it's not always connected. This this connection right here may or may not be connected. Okay, so what connects it or disconnects it? By default, it's not connected. So if you say pin mode input, uh -huh. then it's not connected. Okay. And so, so internally to the eight to the RDNL, there's kind of like these little switches. Really? Each one of the pins. It's a little switch. And by changing the mode, it kind of turns off and on the switches to each of the RDNLs, like the resistor. Okay. And so the purpose of adding that resistor is what? Just to keep it from like free flowing current? The um, mode it, it's called a floating input. Thank you. Um, what will happen without this connected is this input here, it could be 0 volts, it could be 1 volt, it could be 4.726. And when somebody walks by, literally, it'll change to 3.8A. I mean, it floats. It literally moves all over the place. Um, Technically, it's it becomes an antenna. Mm -hmm. It is literally an antenna. It will pick up noise. Um, sometimes people use that on purpose. If they want some random input, they'll leave a floating input pin and look at the electrical noise around in the environment. We don't want that. We want it to be, for sure, plus five, unless they're pressing the button. So how does adding that resistor kind of get it to settle down and stop Because what's happening is that there's um, the the input has what they call a characteristic impedance, and it's usually high. Um, essentially, we can draw a resistor here that's like 10 mega ohms, very high. So with 20k on top of 10 mega ohms, most of the voltage is right here, and it guarantees. So a little bit of current, you know, flows down through here. Not enough to waste energy, but enough to make sure that it's at plus five. Well, that's all I have for you formally today. I encourage you to go on through the rest of the lessons. They're fun, just as much fun as this has been. Do you have any closing questions? Where can we find you at? <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> plug, plug all your uh, plug all your stuff. Yeah, the key makers and you know where where we can find you online, stuff like that. Okay. Um actually probably the easiest for you guys would be through the meetup. I do respond to meetup messages. Um as there for is the next meetup. We don't currently have one planned. Oh, there is one. We were waiting for you to volunteer. No, I I sent I sent you see my little email with the little text about Packing an RC car? Yes, I got you. Okay. Yeah. We had some communication issues, but I will communicate with you about that. Okay. That's awesome. I, mean, I, I threw out an idea. Okay, fantastic. I I may have I may not have followed up on one that I should have. I'll I'll check. No, I'm not trying to so I just I didn't want you to think that I not responded. Okay. We are trying to do them every two weeks and so the next one would be March twenty fifth. The other thing that I think Marcus is kind of interesting on that is, is, you know, we might have good ideas but not really know how to use them, right? Yeah. So then let's treat it kind of like, uh, you know, an agile scrum project, right? Where we come together as a group. And we have a spike. And have a spike and say, well, I don't know how to do this. How are we going to do this? And we figure it out together and do it. Absolutely. And uh, group, I do group, a lot of that at work. Group projects are fun. I do a lot of yes. that at work where, you know, we don't exactly know what we're doing. We know that the business wants us to do it, so we have to go figure out how to do it. I have, I have two questions. Okay. So of course, you plug all of your things. So I do want to hear all of them. Machine learning. What? Um, one is, um, I want to do a project that uses one in five volts. Is there a way to do that? Is there the opposite effect? Yes and no. Um, there pretty much aren't any microcontrollers that can do more than 5 volts. So what you end up doing is having interfaces to the higher voltage parts of the circuit. Use a transistor to do a voltage conversion or whatever. How can I learn more about that? Because I have a project where I need to do that. 
Actually, you might be surprised to learn one, one of the lessons in here covers how to, they, they have a chip called a, a 595 chip, and it's used for level conversion for voltages. Um, I believe there's also one on motors where they talk about motors commonly need higher voltages. Um, you know, especially if you're doing like an e-bike or something, they want 48 volts or 60 volts. Um, so then you need the, the power transistors to run those. I thought the shields were provided by a lot of higher voltage. Yes, one of the motor shields um, will do up to 12 volts. I'm not trying to do an e-bike, I'm trying to drive an electronic loom. Um, actually, one of the oh, a loom. Oh, interesting. And it's, it uses like an old serial picture. Okay. Um, and you can't find the computers with all the serial ports, but I thought if I could get the Arduino and I could get the, um, if I could somehow read what the current serial port expects, I could create like a little Arduino interface. But I'm driving solar lights that help pick the shafts that you're up, and I'm not sure what voltage they take. So there's a bit of research involved in it as well. I'm, I'm going to recommend that you not do that. Not as my first project? Um, not so much that, but just that um, there's a surprising amount of complexity in those serial ports. Really? Okay. And they make custom chips that are just for that purpose. Okay. So let me help you find one. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So what do the custom chips do? They're, they're custom built to interface old serial ports with a USB port. Okay. I got like a serial Bluetooth connector because I was thinking it'd be fun to drive the loom through the Bluetooth or everything. Okay. But the part of the problem is I have to see what the loom protocol is. I'm sure it's right. only six, I mean, they're only 24 shafts, so it's got to be a number between like 124, but I need like a way to kind of creep on what's being, because I have a working example. Okay. People are like, what's being sent back and forth? Because I don't know, because the loom manufacturer won't share the protocol, so I kind of need to like yeah. reverse so, engineer. So yes, there's a way to do that. You can sniff those lines. You can sniff the traffic that it goes back and forth. How, do I do that with a voltage meter, or is it something more complicated? I couldn't do it with a meter. You. You'd need one of these devices I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Let me look okay. here and see if I can find one. Like no, that's fine. We're, we're done. Yeah.